Welcome to Meet the Masters of Income Property Investing. I'm your host, Jason Hartman. The 2019 Meet the Masters of Income Property, March 23rd and 24th in Newport Beach, California. What is the sort of the one trick, the hack, the secret that really empowers people to success? Income property, the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. Register today at jasonhartman.com forward slash masters. Early bird pricing ends Friday, February 1st. Let's break this down and look at some of the strengths of income property as an asset class. I found that this event is really helpful because I'm totally a newbie to real estate investment. And so I picked up so much information. One of the great things about it is that it's so fragmented, right? Embrace the fragmentation. JasonHartman.com forward slash masters. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome back a returning guest, and that is Mr. Harry Dent. Of course, you've probably been following his work for many decades, as have I. He is back on the show. His latest book is entitled Zero Hour, and he's got many other great books before that. And he's coming to us today from Puerto Rico. Harry, how are you? Good, good, Jason. Good, good. It's good to have you back on the show. Would it be fair to say that you're you're pretty optimistic right now, right? Not completely, but uh, maybe more so than usual. I, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I am more than usual. I mean, you know, we've been calling this a bubble for a long time. It's going to burst. It has started slowly in real estate. It is not in stocks yet. And a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, maybe the peak last year was a peak. And you know what? I've got an easy indicator. The first crash in a stock bubble like this should be 40% in the first two and a half months. No mercy. And mm -hmm. this did. So I'm saying that it looks like this is a correction in stocks. Stock should have another bubble, probably going to last most of 2019. That gives the economy some more breathing room. On the other hand, as you know, real estate is starting to top out in high-end markets. Oh, and yeah. in the 2007 bubble burst and in the Great Recession, real estate was our best leading indicator because it started to slow in 2006 ahead of the stock market. Mm -hmm. When the economy is going into recession, is it always led by real estate? Does real estate always slow first? Is that leading indicator you mentioned? Or is that just last time and maybe this time too? Typically, it doesn't. Stocks usually slow first. But we have a stock market that's unusual. It's being driven largely by corporations buying back their own stocks. Right. Now, here's the global reality. Governments around the world, U.S. and almost everybody, they're buying their own. They're issuing record debt like the U.S. We got 22 trillion now, 1.2 trillion a year, actually more than that with the off balance sheet. But whatever. Mm -hmm. record debt, and they're buying their own bonds to push interest rates down and make that uh, right. easy uh, float and, and, and pay the interest at low rate. Yeah. So this is I don't know that you would call this a Ponzi scheme. It's not exactly that, but it is a scheme for sure, because what they're doing is they're creating this artificial market. Governments do it with their treasury bonds. Companies are doing it with their stock buybacks. Unpack that a little more for us. And, and let's talk about the significance of that. Yeah. And, and the treasury bonds are the key. People don't realize Federal Reserve, they can set short term rates, but long term rates they can only impact is by buying their own bonds and right. pushing down the rates and up the price. Mm -hmm. so, so when they do that, it lowers the cost of borrowing for companies that raises their profits. But it also means they can borrow cheap with their corporate bonds and buy back their own stocks and leverage their earnings per share. So this stock market is mostly about leveraging earnings per share, buying back stocks. It's less about the economy being stronger than ever, as, as Trump would say. It's not stronger than ever. We've averaged a little over 2% growth since 2009. Most recoveries are 4% plus. And the typical recovery would see stocks be ahead of the economy and market. But because of this artificial buying, stocks may be the latest. And I'd say only in recent years. 2006 was the first time I saw that real estate, Prices peaked, activity peaked in late 2005, 
prices peaked in early 2006, we call that in our newsletter. Mm -hmm. Real estate started to go down slowly while stocks are still going up. The economy is still booming. So real estate wasn't going down because the economy is bad. It was going down because of the bad loans, subprime yeah, loans. Right, that right. As far as the real estate goes, we really do not have that this time. I mean, I do not. I, I see there are tiny little signs of imprudent lending, but there are very few and far between, right? Yes, that is not. The problem now is just as usual. Prices are getting overextended. They're higher and higher. I mean, San Francisco, where I used to live, is just crazy. I just showed in my newsletter that for a starter home buyer, now, now isolate them because that's a whole different set. Average price of a starter home in San Francisco is 895000 The income is 34500 That's 25 times their earnings. Now, you know, you know, if there ever was an example of a banana republic, it has got to be San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, and you got homeless and yeah. feces. Oh, it's terrible. People are having to move out. I just met a guy in Puerto Rico that's moving down here, software designer, because he can't afford to live. And he's a software designer. Right. He makes a yeah. grand year. He can't afford to live in sure. San Francisco. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, on that, since we're talking about the San Francisco market, just for a little tangent here, I would say that that is very, very connected to the stock market and the VC market, of course, right? When that evaporates, boy, that is just going to, I mean, that is built on a house of cards, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. They're the center for the whole tech bubble. The tech stocks are leading this bubble, just like they did the one in the 90s. And people are moving into these headquarters. People in San Francisco hate Google, hate big tech companies, because right. they them is bidding up prices and driving out them out of their city. Same reason people in Vancouver hate Chinese because mm -hmm. they're the one drives their foreign buyers. So right. this is not whatever, but th that is the key thing, Jason. This top is being started as we've been predicting, and it's also happening in Teflon, Sydney, and Melbourne, Australia. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The high end is cracking first. And it's because the prices are just so extreme and they get bid up the most by foreign buyers there. And the fact that upscale households are doing so much better than Homer Simpson, mm -hmm. it's breaking at the high end. And it's, this time it's going to filter down to the low end. Last time it was subprime mortgages faltering and then it built up to the high end. So the high end is where this is starting. And again, I was just talking with another newsletter writer who just moved to Puerto Rico. He's trying to sell his Dallas place. Prime downtown upscale condo. Mm -hmm. He not get a good bid. He may just have to sell it for what he doesn't want to. Right. And a year or two ago, that would have been a cinch to sell that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, the the market has definitely Miami and San Francisco. It's Dallas. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No. No. The market has definitely cooled, and it is continuing to cool. One of our celebrity clients uh, just sent me a. Uh, a Zillow listing the other night about a $30 million home in Los Angeles. He says, this is just beyond ridiculous here. It is just beyond ridiculous. And I said, it's changing, though. Uh, the buyers are rejecting those prices and homes are sitting on the market. And even in places, you know, south of L.A., like Orange County, my old hometown, we're seeing stuff that's, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand softening. Is this going to trickle down? See, I, I wonder if the just the lower end of the market, the stuff we like in Memphis, Indianapolis, these boring markets, Little Rock, Atlanta, et cetera. And Atlanta is not that boring, but <laughs> the rest of them are, uh, you know, when you're looking at hundred and fifty thousand dollar houses, only because the builders this time around coming out of the Great Recession, they just didn't build for that market at all. There's just been no supply added. And when I say no supply, of course, it's a figure of speech. But I know it's trickling down, and I think that'll continue. But how far can it trickle down? It will trickle down. But but it, I always say the greater the bubble, the greater the burst. And the greatest bubbles happen in the coastal cities. The greatest bubbles happen in the upscale markets. And, and it does trickle down. But the lower-end markets will hold up better. And there are plenty of markets, Jason, as you already know. All the, the whole middle of the country is not really bubbly. I mean, right. yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have, there's so many places where rent, first of all, rentals are more favored because a lot of people are struggling economically. They're mm -hmm. in industrial places that are losing jobs. Mm -hmm. These places didn't bubble up so much. So there are places where you can buy real estate affordably, rent it out for positive cash flow. 
and leverage that. You just can't do that in the coastal. You can't do that in South Beach, Miami. You can't do that in San Francisco or Seattle or Manhattan or Sydney and Melbourne or Singapore. So that's the key. Mm -hmm. The smart people are buying real estate in affordable areas where you can rent out. Like the key sign, if you can rent it out at positive cash flow, mm -hmm. as you're not that overvalued and you can make money there, try to rent out a downtown uh, oh. condo in San Francisco yeah. positive. Good luck. Yeah. Totally positive. Yeah, yeah, not even, not even close. And we should mention, you mentioned Puerto Rico a few times. I just wanted to mention for the listeners who don't know, and we've done entire episodes on this, Puerto Rico has become a tax haven. And interestingly, you did not move there for that reason, but it uh, sort of happened to you afterwards. And many of my friends have moved down there, uh, you know, uh, very well-to-do people. Last time I was there, uh, just about uh, six, eight months ago, maybe, you know, I, I met uh, hedge fund managers at the pool, <laughs> at, the, at the resort, and, you know, they had moved there. And it, it's just kind of a, it's interesting what's going on down there. It's a rather small number, though, in the aggregate, but uh, you're definitely seeing a trend, right? Small number, but there are people that come here and spend a lot of money on real estate. Mm -hmm. That's interesting you say that because the real estate in Puerto Rico is not cheap. That's priced in. I mean, it's expensive there. It's, it's, not, it's not cheap. That's the reason I moved here. We were about to move from Tampa, which is some, you know, bubbly, but not as bubbly. Not as too Miami. much. Yeah. Miami's double the bubble. Bubble. We were in Miami for the first bubble. Thousand dollars a square foot for a high end beach. Now ridiculous. it's square foot. Mm -hmm. The condo I'm in is nicer, nicer than anything I get in South Beach. Five hundred dollars a square foot. One quarter the price, whether I rent or buy. That I moved here because I realized we could get a much better condo in Puerto Rico, and I'd be closer to finishing my vacation house on this island, which is very hard to do from a distance. So. I moved here for that. And mm -hmm. then some people here showed me how I could work with their company and get the tax advantages as well. So yeah. this has been a bonanza for me. Now, Puerto Rico, the condo I'm in would be considered expensive here. And people mm -hmm. say that's a bubble. Mm -hmm. No, Miami or Manhattan, this is cheap. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's just not super cheap. You know, it's it's not as inexpensive as I thought it would be. And then you look at a place like, what is it, Dorado that I went to, and you're you're way into $1,000, 1500 a square foot. But that's Dorado. Again, I'm in a really nice place, and it is cheap compared to the similar thing. I'm in the hottest part, Condado. It's like the South Beach of San Juan. Mm -hmm. and order the price. That's a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. Fair enough. Okay, so Harry, uh, you have made so many predictions in your career and your career. When did you write your first book? I first discovered you back in 1995. Uh, and I can't remember the book title off the top of my head. But I was just fascinated by your, your methodology of economic demographer, so forth. When, when did you write your first book? Okay, the first book was self-published. It was called Our Power to Predict. That was 1989. Wow, okay, yeah. My best prediction ever that I didn't get as much credit for. I got predict credit for calling a Dow 10,000 by 2000 in the early 90s when we were in a recession. Mm -hmm. And people thought it was crazy. In 1989, I said in the 90s, Japan's whole economy and bubble was going to collapse, and the U.S. and Europe, which were considered sunset economies then, would have their best decade ever. Mm -hmm. I called and, and that was absolutely right. And that was all just demographics. Just uh -huh. demographics. Yeah. Japan was at their peak of their baby boom spending cycle, and the U.S. and Europe were just getting started. And, and you know, I remember that back in 1989 when everybody, or really the late 80s, but going up to 89, when it, there was this xenophobia going on, everybody thought Japan is going to take over the U.S., and, and nothing could have been further from the truth, and, and you have rightfully talked about their demographic disaster. And, you know, the conservative commentator, who is a, a very funny guy, Mark Stein, he talks about that, too. I don't know if you know his work, but he, yeah. he says, he says, look, in 50 years, Japan, Russia, Western Europe, they basically won't exist. You can't yeah. have a country without people uh, and they don't have people. And now you've called that about China because China's one child policy for so many years is it has set up the seeds of absolute disaster coming China's way. Right. And, you know, they finally started lightening up on that and people aren't listening. They're not doing it. 
Asians are the worst. When Asians, people who, who move to urban areas and get more affluent have less kids because it takes more to raise those kids. Mm -hmm. So natural thing. Asians are even more that way than U.S. and Europeans. So they have the lowest birth rates in the world. And again, China comes back and says, OK, now you can have two. Well, nobody's taken them up on that. Not yeah. many people. So they're the only emerging country. Well, there. there, there's a shortage of females. I mean, there's a tremendous shortage of females. So even if they wanted to, <laughs> good luck finding. I, I thought it was hard for me to find a mate here in the U.S., but it's worse there. But there were China's workforce peaked in 2011. But something more important, Jason, they've been living off of rural people moving to urban right. areas at rapid rates. And the governments have been pushing that too fast. That's why they have so many empty condos and cities. And stuff. Oh, they have entire ghost cities. I, I We've talked about this on the show. It is mind boggling. And if you go and look on YouTube, just type, you know, China ghost city, you'll see these videos. They, they are, they're spooky. I mean, a high rise after high rise that's just vacant. 27% of condos empty, even in cities that aren't ghost cities, real cities like Shanghai or something. Yeah. So this is crazy, but what nobody's noticed is those urban, those rural migrants moving into urban areas, they're moving back because the mm -hmm. price is too high. They're second class right. citizens. Yeah. Their kids can't go to school there. The smog, the traffic, they're moving back. So that urbanization push is the only thing China has going for it. Mm -hmm. That's stopping for now. So China, I think China's going to be the epicenter of a global real estate crash, and that's going to eventually back up on high-end real estate. So, because again, who are the foreign buyers that are most buying? Chinese foreign buyers, wealthy Chinese, yeah. So when they stop buying, that's gonna be a double whammy to these upscale markets mm -hmm. like Seattle, Vancouver. Oh, yeah. uh, the whole West Coast, yeah, absolutely. I like to say that, you know, as everybody's worried about the, the, you know, they view China to some extent as a threat, right? A threat to the US. You know, and my answer to that is China, it's a miracle what they've accomplished. No question. I don't want to take that away from them. Uh, it really is a total miracle, especially in a country that is technically a communist country. It is a miracle. But China is highly overrated. I mean, if, if you ask me, I, I just don't think... When does that demographic time bomb really hit China and their economy? Is that about 10, 15 years away or a little further? It's already hitting... But it gets worse after 2020. Japan also, their baby boom burst in spending. Their millennials have been coming along ahead of us. Japan's ahead of us 10 to 15 years on this whole generation cycle. Their millennials are going to peak in 2020. That's just two years away mm -hmm. and turn down. And Japan's going to get weaker even faster again. So East Asia, China, and, and all the tiger countries are going to be in a big slowdown. I think it's going to take China 10 years to catch up to capacity. Then they can still grow by urbanization, but demographics will work against them forever in, in all of East Asia. What I think China's burst is going to do, put the world focus on India. So India is going to be the next big infrastructure boom and real estate boom. Uh -huh. and in the U.S., you have to look at the areas that are going to do best after a crash. And, mm -hmm. and I think those it's still going to be apartment rentals, positive cash flow, and it's going to be affordable starter yep. homes. Be Absolutely. Yeah. I call it necessity housing. You know, that necessity housing, it's always going to be needed. And it's in especially short supply now because yeah. in the last 10 years, they haven't built any. There's almost no construction in a decade in that whole category, that whole product segment in the U.S. The home builders went for the higher end, more profitable homes, which demographics would have told you was the wrong place to be anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. It's really weird. So in the U.S., I mean, your real specialty is, is demographics and how they impact the economy. And when I first discovered your work in 1995, you talked about, you know, baby food and pampers and, you know, the diapers and the, and the Gerber baby food and how that, you know, you could just tell that that wave was coming by just simply looking at the birth rate and then yeah. adjusting a certain number of years, right? It, it's so obvious. Surprisingly simple. It took me a long time to figure it out. But once you figure it out, I take any sector and say, okay, when are people going to spend the most on that? Lag the birth index for that number. And I'll tell you, you know what the hottest single sector of the U.S. economy is going to be for decades to come? Nursing homes and assisted living. Right, so, right. Okay, so I agree with you. However, I just I want to caution listeners on that, okay? I've done a lot of investigation into this, and I believe that that is largely priced in already. 
okay? They've been built. You know, in the 80s, they were talking about the graying of America. In early 80s, saw women. They have, they're just starting to enter it. It hasn't been overbuilt. It's been declining because there hasn't been demand for it. The demand just starts on my lag. 2018, 2019 goes up for 26 years. Oh, no, no, no. I know the demand is there. I'm just saying there have been suppliers coming to meet that market. I mean, they're building them everywhere. You know, supply now. Yeah. That will not last long. Right, right. Yeah. When we look at uh, demographic cohorts, Harry, and we look at, you know, the baby boomers and then Gen X, my generation, and then uh, the millennial Gen Y generation, finally, and I'm so sick of talking about, about millennials. Sorry, millennials. I'm just sick of it. <laughs> I'm sick of you guys. I've been talking about you for so long. Now we're starting to talk about Generation Z. Okay. And what's interesting is in Japan and China, there's literally no Generation Z, is there, to speak of? No. Wow. Same, same with Europe. Southern and Central Europe from Germany all yeah. throughout the Mediterranean. Yeah. There is no echo boom. There's no generation wow. follow, so things decline and they continue to decline. I want to borrow a term from the environmental movement, and here it is. Extinction is forever. Better have some kids, folks, or you're going extinct, because that's exactly what's happening with all of the... And Russia, too. Don't forget Russia. Well, the other thing you can do, like Australia and New Zealand, I mean, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, countries like that, Singapore... They're not having any more kids than we are. They attract high quality immigrants because they have good English speaking universities. And that's what immigrants around the world want. We are now turning away immigrants. Canada is, is increasing in immigrants. Australia has the highest quantity of immigrants. Qu Canada has the highest quality of education. Those countries are increasing their demographics without having more babies because it's hard to get urban affluent people to have more babies. They don't yeah. want to. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. So talk to us about Gen Z a little bit. Let's just wrap up with that topic. There's just not enough talk about Generation Z. What are they like? How big is the cohort? What's going to be their impact on the real estate market, the economy, etc.? Well, well, I break down the millennials into two phases. The first phase was born into 1990 the second phase into 2007. Now, births have been declining since 2007. I predicted that long before it happened because I knew when the economy started to weaken, people have fewer kids. It's another factor. So the second wave of the millennials, we don't know. I mean, they haven't even really entered the workforce yet. So we just know they're, they're going to be more, a little more like baby boomers, more creative, more individualistic. They might flout their wealth a little more. The first wave, the millennials, who are basically buying houses now, are more like the Bob Hope generation. So I, I think their lifestyles are going to be different. The problem is that first wave that were born into 1990 got a lot more of the immigrants backing up. That second wave is not going to be as strong as I thought it would be. So it's not going to be the first wave of millennials that will peak and start our home buying in the next five years will not be exceeded by this next wave. There, there'll be another wave, but it will not be as strong. So so these are the pe people that ca I like catching the first wave of the millennium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Harry, are there any questions I didn't ask you? Anything you just want to share with our audience and then give out your website too? Again, there's always something booming in demographics. You know, so aging baby boomer stuff. Vacation homes are still kind of hot, but that won't be for too much longer. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's another. <laughs> I registered a domain name, and it's B and B Prophecy <laughs> because that market is totally oversupplied. <laughs> yeah, that, that one I agree. Yeah. That's about over, and, and it has been oversupplied. It really is the, the millennials. There, there's going to be enough homes for millennials, but like I say, it's not going to be the right homes in the right places. So that's where people will do the best there. But there's always another part of the world. And really, everything says that Asia, outside of China and the tiger countries, it'll be everything over a Southeast Asia and, and India. So people can be looking in the future. I mean, you could build parking lots in Mumbai for five decades and never, you know, never oversupply, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're going to be the next China, and, and, and the demographics are there. And, hey, Africa's got good demographics, but they got horrible economics and politics and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, really, real estate really does come down to these catching the millennials at this point because the baby boomers, except for nursing homes, and that's a whole different business, 
Uh, and it would really need more like corporate investment to do that right. Right. That's really the place. Uh, what are the millennials going to want? And they're going to want affordable starter homes and it's going to be a good while. That's another decade out after this. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Harry Dent, thanks for joining us. Website, HS Dent? No, harrydent.com. And you, we have a free newsletter you can get on to, to get to know us. All you got to do is put in you know, your email address. Fantastic. Harry Dent, thanks again for joining us. Okay, sure, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.